Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Shirwa Talwen. I'm Associate Professor of Operations Management and the Director of the MBA and the Executive MBA programs at the AUC School of Business. Um, this here is session five of our masterclass series, where we invite our international faculty from the executive MBA program to join us uh, in, online. Um, uh, the executive MBA program at the AUC is, uh, again, uh, is a highly ranked program, and it's uh, offered by the School of Business, a triple crown accredited school. Uh, only 1% of uh, universities worldwide qualify for that. Uh, the, uh, the MBA program has been offered for uh, many years now, and it was designed to cater for top management executives uh, in Egypt and the region, uh, both in terms of the content we cover, uh, the course material, the relevant topics we offer, but also, again, in the way we deliver uh, the content. So uh, business cases, hands-on experiences. Uh, the schedule, again, is broken down into 12 weekend modules uh, over 20 months, so where you work, you know, three month, three week, you know, three weekends, and then you meet for a weekend. Uh, and again, uh, we're very happy to stay in close contact with our students and alumni through these sessions. Uh, we do promise a lifelong learning experience. This is one of what we do. We bring in our, you know, we always love to feel that you have contact with your uh, faculty, and you can always reach out to them in difficult times. So, what better time to reach out to our very uh, own uh, Dr. Uh, Orlean Colson? He is uh, associate professor at political science and ESSEC uh, France Business School. Uh, he is also the director of the Institute for Research and Education uh, in, pa in Paris, in Singapore, and Brussels. It's uh, an organization for now for more than 12 years, and they uh, run their operations in 80 countries discussing negotiation, mitigation, conflict resolution, uh, governance, uh, CSR, stakeholder uh, dialogue, again, uh, over, many, uh, over the many topics related to management. Uh, Dr. Colson teaches in the Executive MBA the negotiation module, uh, but he also teaches change management and leadership in multiple programs. Uh, today, we will be talking about uh, the influence and negotiation for better deal making. Maybe this is definitely the time to do so. Uh, Dr. Colson, thank you for being with us. Um, you will go through, uh, you know, uh, 30 to 40 minutes of slides, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased indeed to be online with you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, AUC for their very kind invitation. Uh, it seems like you have a, a smashing program. And I hope that all of you are sound, safe, healthy in those difficult times. Uh, and that uh, we're going to have together a fruitful and productive uh, session. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is indeed Aurélien Colson. Um, I'm a, a professor of political science at ESSEC Business School, where I'm the director of a research and training center on negotiation and deal making. So basically for the last uh, 20 plus years, I've um, done research in those areas, which means that I published papers in scientific journals, which nobody ever, ever reads, but then I have to do it. <laughs> but I've also been uh, consulting a lot, and together with the team, we have uh, assignments on a regular basis for uh, corporations, uh, um, organizations. We work a lot for the European Union. Um, and indeed, altogether, we've done things in 80 plus countries which means that we've been able to uh, see on the field what works and what doesn't work so well when it comes to uh, negotiation, convincing partners, uh, um, deal-making. So basically in the coming um, uh, half an hour, I would like to share with you a number of best practices uh, which can help you um, establish a proper negotiation strategy and. Uh, expect good results uh, when it comes to influencing partners and uh, deal making. Um, voilà. The idea will be to, first of all, share with you uh, 10 principles, uh, very operational principles, uh, which can guide you from beginning to end in a negotiation sequence. But then, of course, we'll have uh, questions. And uh, as you know, because this is the, uh, I think, the fifth uh, conference in this AUC series, 
you can use the chat to uh, share questions and uh, I'll make sure to try and provide you with uh, answers before we stop this uh, around five. Voila. I'm going to share the screen to um, uh, show you a little bit of my presentation, but um, I hope that all of you, you know, you can see that. So indeed, as I said, um, we've been collecting experience with a number of um, uh, partners uh, in business, but also in uh, the more diplomatic spheres. Uh, I served as advisor to the French prime minister for a number of years. And basically at the end of the day, uh, the notion is uh, what can help you in a negotiation? But first of all, I have a question for you, which is you decided to join this conference uh, probably because there's some good reason uh, about the topic, negotiation influence. So if you pause for a second, um, can you list with who you negotiate, with who you have negotiated, or with whom you will be negotiating? Make a little listing of those negotiation partners. And probably you get to end up with a first ID, which is that um, negotiation is pretty much everywhere. Uh, all of us, we have to negotiate with uh, external partners. It could be uh, customers, suppliers, uh, uh, various authorities. Uh, and we also negotiate internally uh, within your organization, uh, especially if it is a, a bigger organization, you're going to negotiate with colleagues on joint projects. Uh, you have to negotiate with the team members. So negotiation is something pretty uh, pervasive. Uh, so we're going to talk together about something which is um, almost every day in our lives. Uh, a second good reason uh, to follow this conference is that good negotiation helps you make a difference. I guess that we all agree that depending how well you negotiate, in the end, the result won't be the same, okay? Uh, depending how well you negotiate, you will get the contract or you won't. Uh, the margin left for you in the end will be uh, thicker or thinner depending uh, how will you do this? So good negotiation does make a difference. And the third reason why um, you're right to follow this uh, online session on negotiation and deal making is because it's possible to learn. I mean, all of you, you have experience. Uh, and the purpose for me is to try and add a little bit on your experience and help you go a little bit further. And that is why uh, as soon as we finish with this presentation, we'll have time for questions because basically my job here is to make sure that I try and provide you with answers to your questions, okay? The questions you have in mind. Uh, voila, so let's start. And as I said, I would like to share with you 10 principles. And these principles will be around the following ID. How can we do first things first in a negotiation? How can we build an effective sequence from beginning to end uh, in a negotiation? We've thought a lot about this. We've discussed with plenty of negotiators in various countries, in various business sectors. We've analyzed plenty of cases and we came up with a pretty simple ID, which I'm going to share with you. We've realized that in negotiation, in deal making, in the art of influencing others, many things are obvious. Obvious in the sense you see them from very far away and everybody will do them because it's so obvious that you have to do them. Typically, if you want to convince someone, if you want to negotiate with someone, you obviously need to speak to that person. So speaking is obvious, but it's so obvious that it makes people forget that before that, they should take care of something which is far more essential. And that is listening to people. Because if you listen to people, and if you listen properly to people, you get valuable information, you establish connection with the person so that when you next start speaking, you have a greater chance to convey the message because you've established something beforehand. So the 10 principles I'm going to share with you are based on the same structure. Do the essential, before turning to the obvious thing. And I'm going to start with the first principle on which I'm going to spend a little bit of time because it is so important. So principle number one is, what do you think 
is the constant preoccupation of all very talented and effective negotiators. And they do this constantly before anything else, anything else. And we've known that for centuries, actually, because as you probably know, people haven't started negotiating, you know, uh, 15 years ago, okay? Uh, people have negotiated for centuries and probably in, in Egypt for thousands of years. The constant preoccupation is to build connection with people, to establish relationships. Because whenever you negotiate over things, you actually negotiate with people. And people will have feelings. People will be rooted in cultures. People will have pride, anger, fear, emotions. And that's the bedrock of negotiation. If you are interested in history, uh, you probably know that the way countries have negotiated throughout history has changed enormously in the 15th century. Uh, I, I talk with my own centuries. So uh, that is the Italian Renaissance in Europe. And the shift was the following. Before the Italian Renaissance, when countries had to negotiate something, they would send a special envoy to the other country. And this special envoy would go there and negotiate and then come back. In the Italian Renaissance, things change. All the little countries in Europe, they start positioning permanent ambassadors in the neighboring countries. And of course, these permanent ambassadors, for a couple of years, they do nothing. But bizarrely, when they have to negotiate something, they achieve much better results. And why? Because of this principle. Because they managed to establish connection, trust, relationship before they need it. So this is a five century old story, but in the last 30 years, psychology experiment, social psychology research has demonstrated that in deal making, in negotiation, it is not when you need trust that it's easy to build it. It's much better, much more effective to try and build trust as early as possible. And that's, principle is even more robust and powerful in the negative sense, by which I mean that when the relationship with a potential partner is not good because something happened, even if you put on the table interesting proposals, these proposals are going to be negatively rejected by the other side of the table. This is a cognitive bias which was demonstrated by the social psychology professor at Stanford University, Lee Ross. And he termed this bias reactive devaluation. So do not lose any opportunity to create bonds, connections, relationships with potential partners so that the day you need them, you can start with this bedrock of a working relationship. And this is even more important at the moment because in many parts of the world, uh, we are confined, contained in quarantine because of the uh, COVID pandemic, and people miss enormously this direct connection. So do not waste any opportunity to be in touch with your partner, to give news, to ask for news, because this is a very, very sound investment for uh, later on when business resumes. So just to conclude on this first principle, relationship before anything else, it helps also understand that any deal-making process, any negotiation will be structured by three dimensions, three dimensions. One of them is obvious, and that's the problem we have to take care of or the solution we have to find. So that is the substantive, substantial part of the negotiation. But as I said, in a negotiation, whatever you negotiate about, you have to negotiate with people. And that will be a very important dimension of any negotiation. Connecting with people, uh, knowing more about each other, 
uh, can pave uh, the way for proper discussion on the substance. And the third dimension is something which is also usually overlooked, underestimated. And, and my job as a consultant on a regular basis is to help uh, the people that I advise on this third dimension. And that is the process. How are we going to negotiate? How do we structure uh, the negotiation um, uh, effort in terms of number of meetings, time available, uh, the agenda, the, the working methods, even the logistics can be uh, very important. So just finishing this principle number one, do not over-focus your negotiation effort, your deal-making effort on the problem dimension. Take care of people and make sure you establish the process the correct way. And this, I'll come back a bit later. Now, moving into this sequence, let's go to principle number two. Now, let's imagine that in a given business situation, you have to do something in order to achieve a given objective. So you have to engage into action. You have to engage into negotiation. That's obvious. Okay? If you don't negotiate, you're not going to get anything. But before that, there is something which is absolutely essential. And that is, how can you get prepared? We usually say in negotiation, um, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So please do take this principle number two as seriously as you can. Even if you have only half an hour before a business meeting, take the time to prepare. Now, of course, the challenge is uh, sometimes we have indeed little, little time. So is there any method which can help you cover all the areas, help us make sure that we don't forget any important uh, area of the upcoming negotiation? Well, we've thought a lot about this. And later on, I will advise you to have a look at one of my book, uh, which is uh, called The First Move. I'll show it here. Uh, but you have the details uh, uh, on the website. Chapter two is about preparation. And we came up with a a method of preparation, which basically wraps everything in 10 points, 10 points. So let me walk you through those 10 points. Um, and the more you get familiar with them, of course, the easier they are to use and the more effective they become. So 10 points. And those 10 points, they feed into the three dimensions I've just told you about. People, problem, and process. As far as people are concerned, when you want to get prepared, you have to look at three categories of people. First, who will be at the table, at the negotiation table? Who will be the other negotiators? And you have to build a little diagnosis of the sort of relationship you have. Maybe that's the first time you meet, so you need to be extra careful with the first impressions. Maybe you know each other already and there is a good relationship then okay, move on. But maybe you've known each other a little bit, but something happens, so the relationship is in distress. And then of course, think of principle number one, you have to do something to improve the relationship before anything else. Second category of people, usually in a negotiation, people around the table have to report to the real decision maker. Imagine a lawyer, will negotiate on behalf of his customer. Or a CEO will negotiate on behalf of her board. So usually around the negotiation table, you do not have the decision makers. You have negotiators who report to the decision makers. But your job as a negotiator when you get prepared is to first of all identify who is the real decision maker across the table. Is it the person across the table or is it someone above his or her head? And you have, also, of course, to make sure that you know how far you can go, what sort of authority has been given to you by the people you, re you report to. And this set of instructions that you need to clarify with your boss, we call the negotiation mandate. And sometimes we even mention the notion of red lines. What are the red lines that you know you mustn't cross in the negotiation. Otherwise, 
you're going to get in trouble with your boss when you come back from the negotiation. And the third category of people, we call them stakeholders. So basically, these are people, they're not in the room, they're not negotiators, they're not decision makers, they have no authority on the negotiators, but they hold a stake in what is being discussed here without them. So these are other entities, uh, business players somewhere in the neighborhood. They do not have access to the negotiation table, but what is being discussed there has an impact on them. So in your preparation, it might be good to anticipate that. I mean, typically, uh, if you are negotiating, you're a salesperson, uh, you're happy to sell as many things as possible, but you need to make sure that you take into account the stakes of the production manager within your company. Because if you sell more uh, at a given period of time in the year than your colleague can actually manufacture, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so you need to uh, think about these three categories of people. Who's around the table? Who is above uh, giving uh, the uh, instructions? And who is in the neighborhood? On the problem dimension, four points to be prepared. Of course, when we negotiate, we negotiate because we have objectives, interests, motivations, things we need to achieve through the negotiation. And there's no way as a negotiator you can achieve your objectives unless you clarify them very properly. And you need also, in your preparation, to start thinking what could be the objectives of your counterpart. Why are they negotiating with you? What is interesting for them? What are they looking for? What could trigger a yes on their side? Once you've identified these objectives on both sides of the table, it's time to prepare some solutions you can trade at the table. Things you can put on the table, which you think are interesting for you and could be acceptable by the other side. Solutions you can ask the other to put on the table. You need also to anticipate what sort of solutions the other will ask you or that the other will put on the table. So that step-by-step, step, you build together a sort of a package deal with all the solutions fulfilling the various uh, objectives around the table. Next item to be prepared, we call it justification. What is a justification in deal-making and negotiation? It's an argument. It's an objective reference you can use to demonstrate that a given solution has to remain on the table and finally into the deal. So it could be reference to a precedent, could be reference to uh, benchmarking, to uh, uh, the legal system. So basically these are arguments you can to use to demonstrate that this solution must remain um, into the final deal. Last item to be prepared on the problem I mentioned, the solution away from the table or you could call it the plan B. Basically, what will you do if the negotiation crashes down? What is your fallback position? And you need also to anticipate what could be the plan B of the other side. Because imagine if the other side can easily turn to another provider or to another solution away from this negotiation table, then it's going to be a complicated negotiation, negotiation for you because you need to match what the other could do away from the table with your own resources and your own solutions. And on the final dimension, the process, a negotiation has to be organized. And I'll come back to this a bit later. We need to anticipate how we're going to process information sharing. So that's communication. What should you say at the table? What should you avoid saying because it's sensitive or these are weaker points? What are good questions to ask to grab more information from the other side? And what are the tough negotiation, sorry, the tough questions to anticipate because the other is likely to ask you those questions. And finally, the logistics. Do not let the logistics go into your way. Make sure, for instance, that you bring with you enough uh, uh, copies of the document or samples of your products, uh, that your laptop has no connection issues. You don't want to have the logistics in your way. So, you see 10 points of preparation, and that covers everything. And even if you have only 20 minutes before a negotiation meeting, you can go through these 10 points. Moving on with the third principle. Okay, now you're ready 
So the obvious temptation is to go to the meeting, to the external meeting with the uh, potential partners. But before that, make sure that you built internally a consensus. Maybe you will go to this negotiation with colleague of yours because you, re you represent different departments of your company. Make sure that you've built a strong internal consensus on uh, what you want to achieve from this negotiation and how you're going to run the show during the negotiation meeting. Um, that's even more important when you have this uh, structure of negotiation with the difference between the negotiators and the decision makers. Make sure that there is a perfect alignment between the decision makers and the negotiator. Just to give you an example, at the moment in Europe, we have a very complicated negotiation going on between the United Kingdom and the European Union, because the United Kingdom has decided to leave the Union. This is called Brexit. And on the side of the EU, Michel Barnier is the chief negotiator negotiating on behalf of the 27 member states of the EU. And the 27 member states are the decision makers. And Michel Barnier, in the last three years, because this has been going on and on and on, in the last three years, Michel Barnier has managed to maintain a perfect alignment, a perfect internal consensus within the 27 member states. Anytime he had to go and negotiate with his opposite member, uh, David Frost from the UK. So a very important principle. Uh, principle number four. Okay, now you are in the meeting and the obvious temptation now that you are in the meeting is to talk about the problem, is to address the issues at stake, is to try and find solutions to the problems. But before jumping into the substance of the negotiation, you must do something which is essential, and that is clarify the process. How are you going to address the problem? And here, what do we mean by process? We mean things like this. Uh, how long do we have? Is there any deadline on your side, on my side? Imagine you're negotiating um, with someone and you have to report your sales numbers uh, before the end of the quarter, and you're just about to reach the end of the quarter, which means that obviously you're going to be in some sort of pressure because you know you have to close that deal before the end of the quarter. So deadlines, they give a certain flavor to the negotiation, and that's part of the process. Um, you might have one meeting or several meetings. So what is the expected outcome of each of these meetings? The team cast, who will go with you in this meeting? Do you need a special expert for that particular meeting? Because you know that on the agenda of that meeting, you're going to address a highly technical issue that you're not familiar with. Um, and then what are the various rules of the game on this agenda? Do we consider that we discuss point one on the agenda, we close it, and then we move to point two, and then we close it, and there's no coming back? This is what we call the... Uh, the salami technique, we, we, we cut uh, the negotiation, or do we go for the sort of a package deal, by which we mean uh, nothing is decided until everything has been negotiated, which means that until the very end, uh, we can go back to previous points uh, to try and organize a trade-off and find a better balance of the overall deal. So talking about the process, um, basically there are two scenarios you don't want to be in. The first scenario is nobody thought about the process, and therefore your negotiation is likely to be pretty chaotic, and that will not help you achieve your objectives. And the other scenario, which is pretty painful, is that you haven't thought about all of that, but the other side of the table thought about all of that and organized things the way they want things to happen. You haven't yet started negotiating on the substance, you already lost some ground. So remember, process before the problem. Now, once you've done that, you're in the meeting and you're happy to discuss finally about the problem and all the opportunities and the potential and the difficulties. And by doing that, you attempted, of course, to speak and speak and speak and talk and talk and talk. Obviously, as I said earlier, you need to talk. But what is essential before that? 
it will be to listen and to listen well to the other side. Why should we listen and listen properly when we negotiate and when we are into deal making? It's not simply to be nice with the other side, which is good reason per se, but it's not simply to be nice. It is because negotiation is structured with information asymmetry. You know things that they don't know. And they know things that you don't know and that you would like to know. There might be also things that you know and that you hope that they don't know, but they actually know them. Well, anyway, so there's a premium for negotiators who are able to drive information from the other side of the table. And this is what we mean by active listening. It means raising questions, asking questions, helping the other uh, prompt more information sharing in order to diminish this asymmetry of information. And the third reason why it's important to listen is because whenever you listen to someone and you listen properly to that person, what happens? You show respect. You show an authentic interest for their situation. It doesn't mean that you agree with them, but it shows that you are interested by their situation and you're ready to understand the situation, even though you might not necessarily agree with them. And by doing so, it, it is demonstrated that it has a positive impact on the relationship. And building the relationship is, for those of you who remember, principle number one. Because as you will see, these 10 principles, they create a highly coherent system and they support each other. So, listening before speaking too much and telling the wrong thing the wrong way at the wrong moment, okay? Um, a few slides just to remind you of what we mean by active listening or active speaking, um, uh, but there's no need to, to drag on this now. Um, oh, this is interesting. Before I introduce the next principle, in many negotiation and deal making, there will be this big question, who gets what? And of course, all of us, we would like the bigger share. But if you compare the two uh, pictures here, would you prefer to have the bigger share or the smaller share? Most of you would probably say, no, I would like to have the smaller share of the bigger graph. Because of course, it means that you're going to have more, even though it is the smaller share. So here, it illustrates very simply something absolutely crucial in negotiation. And that is my next principle. Obviously, in negotiation, there is the notion of who gets what, value claiming. And all of us, we want to have as big the share as possible. But before that, what is essential is to create value. Because the more you create value, then, of course, the more there is to share. And if you want to have a lot for yourself on your plate in the end, you need to be good at combining those two moves, creating value with the other, which means cooperating with the other, and also being able to claim your share at the expense of the other, which is more a sort of a competition side of negotiation. But we need to be good at both, creating value and claiming value. Um, when it comes to claiming value, I just would like to highlight a couple of things on making effective concessions. So that is the, uh, the bargaining side of negotiation. And just to give you a few tips, imagine that now at that point of the negotiation sequence, you have to agree on figures and budget. And so you need to go into some sort of bargaining. Let me give you a few golden rules for bargaining. The first one is you must know your red line. Your red line is, the point below which you won't go. You prefer to leave the table if you have to reach that point. So that is the, the minimum or, or, or the maximum uh, above which or below which you won't go because of your mandate or because you have a better plan B. And then you need to decide what will be your first anchor. The anchor is uh, the first offer you're going to put on the table, the first package you're going to put on the table because it's pretty well demonstrated that if you anchor well, if you put on the table 
a set of options which look serious, um, which you're able to uh, uh, justify in some way, then the other is likely to accept this as the starting point of the negotiation. Now, from this initial anchor, you need to make uh, concessions, efforts. And here, uh, if I show you various ways, but I'll go straight to the conclusion, don't do this. Here, the first 100 is the initial anchor, 100. And let's imagine that your red line, the point below which you won't go is 60. If you put first 100 on the table and then you stick at 100, whatever the other says or do, probably the other is going to leave the table at some point. So don't do this. You shouldn't do this as well. Uh, as soon as you put 100, if you jump immediately your next move to 60, uh, you waste all your bargaining range. So don't do that. You shouldn't do this also because here you create a pattern minus eight, minus eight, minus eight, which is creating the expectation that you're likely to give in once more towards 52. So don't do this. If I go straight to the last line, because that's the proper way to do concessions, probably you can get the picture. Moving from 100, 87, 76, here, of course, the figures are just uh, random figures, but the meaning is what? The next golden rule for effective concession making is that each new concession should be smaller than the previous one. Basically, you're happy to make efforts at the beginning, so you show the counterpart that you're happy to make efforts to try and um, uh, make a deal together. But the more they push you, the less you can offer because they're pushing you towards your uh, red lines. So think about that. Show good faith at the beginning, but then each new concession should be smaller. Just a few more golden rules for concession making. A concession has to be explicit. If you make an effort, but you're not explicit that you're making a, an effort for the other side, then the benefit of that concession is pretty much lost because the other doesn't even realize that you're making an effort. Look for favorable framing. In deal making and negotiation, what matters is not simply what you say, it's a lot how you say it. So think of how you can present a concession in a way which makes it look good from the viewpoint of the other side. Timing is important. It's pretty well demonstrated. Imagine you start a meeting at 2 p.m. Scenario one, at 2.30 p.m. you put on the table concession X. Scenario two, start the meeting at 2 p.m. and the very same concession X you put on the table at 5.30 three hours later. Research demonstrates and practitioners confirm that it is in the second scenario that your concession is likely to yield a, a better return. Why? Because the other had to fight longer uh, to get the very same concession. And the last golden rule, make clear you expect reciprocity. I'm happy to make efforts, but I'm not going to be the only one around the table to make efforts. So normally the concession should yield some sort of compensation on the other side. Now, if we move on, I have a small exercise uh, to introduce the next principle. Look at this here. I'm going to show you a picture. That's the picture. And looking at that picture, I could ask you, what can you see? And probably many of you are going to see different things. Uh, it's a pity that uh, I don't have easy access here to your responses, but never mind. I'm sure that because I've done that exercise tons of time, people tend to see very different things. But what is actually in that picture? Something that very few people see. There's a cow. There's a cow watching you. And I just show this little exercise because it illustrates the following principle. Whenever you've, we face a problem in negotiation, the temptation will be to look for a solution, but that's one step too quick. And the sequence I advise you to follow is the following. Obviously, we need to look for solutions in order to address problems and issues. 
But if we want to have a greater chance to find the right solutions, first of all, we need to look for more information because maybe the picture you're looking at is only the part of a much wider picture. And you need to take time to look for more information to understand better uh, the objectives, the constraints, the possibilities, the value opportunities in that situation. So search for information before attempting to put on the table solutions. And that search for information is consistent with the two previous principles, preparation before action and listening before speaking. So again, you see these principles, they reinforce each other. Last three principles. Principle number eight, we're now reaching the end of the sequence. And obviously, as negotiators, we need to be realistic. We need to make sure that the solutions we're about to put together in the deal are legal, technically doable, uh, financially uh, sustainable. So good negotiators are realistic, sure. But before that, good negotiators tend to show an opposite quality, which is creativity. There's a premium in negotiation for creative people, people who are not simply going to apply the same routine, but begin to think out of the box and imagine value creating solutions. And this is how they escape from deadlocks or stalemates. Principle number nine, we're very close to the end of the negotiation sequence. Now there is on the table a potential deal, thanks to all the efforts. And obviously, you need to decide, is this a deal and we commit on the deal? Or is the deal not good enough and we have to uh, opt out and resort to our can be? And people like, you know, deciding. But what is essential before the decision stage, it will be to carefully, patiently evaluate what the potential deal means for you. Basically here, the question is, are you sure this is such a good deal? Is it safe enough? Uh, are you sure you've not wasted any opportunity and that the deal cannot be improved? So in order to evaluate the quality of the deal, I provide you here with another checklist. It's a very simple checklist. And you know what? It is based on the very same 10 points we used in principle number two for the preparation. Because a good deal will pass the test of the 10 points of the preparation. Remember, three dimensions, people, problem, process. Let's go through that. On the people dimension, a good deal will maintain or possibly improve the relationship with the other side. It will, of course, respect the mandate you were given by your boss. It will take into account and anticipate the reaction of stakeholders. On the substance, a good deal, of course, will respond to the objectives and motivations of your side and the other side, and at least better than with your plan B. The solutions you pack together create value, and you are able to justify those solutions uh, with objective arguments. And on the process dimension, uh, the process clearly uh, determines who does what for the execution of the deal. You can check in terms of communication that there's no misunderstanding on who's supposed to do what. And even maybe for the final validation signature of the deal, you don't want to have the logistics in the way. So again, the 10 point, they can help you uh, as a checklist to evaluate the quality of the deal. And now for the 10th and final principle, that is a principle which I really hope that you will remember. At the very end of the negotiation sequence, obviously it is time to adjourn, it's time to stop, it's time to move on to something else. Because we have another meeting uh, to go into or simply because we're exhausted. But what is essential before adjourning will be to check, double check, triple check everything in order to validate uh, all the commitments. Because it is demonstrated, again, in research and pretty much confirmed by practitioners, that towards the end of the negotiation sequence, uh, if it is a simple negotiation, then people have to move on to another meeting 
and at a very sensitive closing moment, they tend to make mistakes. So you will remember that principle that before we adjourn, uh, we need to validate, check, and double check. And these are the 10 principles I wanted to share with you. As you can see, anytime we are tempted to do this, because this is the obvious part of deal making and negotiation. Everybody does that. I'm sure you do it perfectly. But my advice is at each of these stages, before you turn to the obvious thing, you have to take care of the essential part, which I've mentioned to you. Voila. This is what I wanted to share with you. And I'm very happy uh, to take uh, questions and try and uh, share answers uh, with all of you. So back to you, Sherwat. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holson. Um, yeah, very, we have some comments. We have some questions already. Uh, on particular, the, you, you mentioned a lot about the organization or the setup that you want to create uh, for the uh, negotiation. Now, given the crisis we're in, in the, you know, you say the room, the table, these are physical stuff. How do we adapt, you know, doing what we do best uh, if it's negotiating uh, in, in, in an online environment or without physical contact? Uh, excellent question indeed. Um, in most parts of the world at the moment, uh, including in France, where I speak from, it's no longer possible to meet physically with people. Uh, nevertheless, in a whole series of business sectors, negotiation had to go on because you had deadlines, contractual deadlines, or you, you had opportunities not to be missed, or you had raising costs. So you had to go on negotiating. And you had, of course, to turn entirely online. So Online negotiation is not entirely new because for ages people have negotiated using the telephone or sending emails or, um, but now uh, it's becoming the new normal. And my bet is that even when the awful COVID pandemics is behind us, in the mix of channels we use in negotiation, the online will be more important than beforehand simply because in the massive economic crisis uh, we're deep into now, companies, organizations have to cut cost. So you won't be traveling around the planet to go and talk with people. Uh, you'll, have through, uh, you'll have to go on the uh, Zoom conference or whatever. And my advice are the following. Basically, when we negotiate, what do we do? First of all, as I said, that was principle number one, you try and build a connection with the other side. You try to establish trust. And here, don't think of establishing trust by sending an email, it's not possible. So you have to, if possible, meet. If you can't meet, go for some sort of visual conference. Uh, but the visual conference uh, will not be excellent typically to draft something. So drafting, the drafting part of negotiation, you have to resort to another mode, which will be probably sending an email. So at the moment, Good negotiators are creating a mix of channels using the various means, sending an email, giving a phone call, organizing a video conference, and probably the right sequence will be the following. Um, hopefully, you've established some connection with the other side. If not, well, you have to do it somehow. Uh, video conferencing is good to have this sort of uh, exchange because you can at the same time hear the people, look at the people. You miss what we call in negotiation the mood in the room. It's complicated to feel exactly the mood in the room. Exactly. Following that, it's probably about sending proposals through email so that you have this anchor and this clarity. Immediately sending the email, organize a phone call, not a video conferencing, a phone call. Why? Because the phone call is less formal. In the, in the phone call, the other side can react to your proposal without being you know, too committing. And on your side, you will hear the reaction of your counterpart without expressing too much in terms of, uh, well, you're pleased because they like your proposal. On the contrary, you're utterly depressed because they hate it. And it's only later that you will go back to some sort of video conferencing. So it's about this sort of uh, sequence and using the various uh, channels we have. Very nice, very nice. Thank you very much. That question actually was from, uh, yeah, I mean, we have a question now from Olavo. Oh, sorry, allow me to flip through my Facebook, all right. Uh, Sani 
saying, how do we negotiate uh, to a selection panel where everyone is super, all right, already, and everyone's trained and everyone's there? How do they get an advantage there? And something about Zopa was mentioned uh, in, re in retaliation to this. So do you have anything to expand on that? Okay, about preparation, basically, you cannot control what the other side is doing, uh, but you should make sure to control your side. So prepare, because if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Then of course, if you negotiate with someone who's totally unprepared, well, it's not black and white, because of, okay, maybe because they're not well prepared, they're going to make a mistake, they're going to tell you things they shouldn't have told you, but now uh, so be it. So it could facilitate a little bit your job because they're unprepared. But it's no so positive, precisely because they're unprepared, they're not going to help you understand value creation opportunities. They're going to probably put on the table suboptimal proposals because they haven't thought well enough about the situation. Uh, you could do more together, but because they're so unprepared, uh, you're not going to make the most of this potential. Now, of course, here, you have to distinguish two cases in terms of negotiation strategy. Is it a short-term negotiation? You're negotiating a sort of a one-shot transaction with the other side. If they are unprepared, that's their problem. Basically, you make the most you can, and then you move on to something else. But in business, most situations are not one shot. When you have identified a reliable customer, uh, sorry, a reliable supplier, you want to keep that supplier. So there is a longer term business relationship. When you have secured a profitable customer, you want to maintain uh, the business relationship with the customer on the longer run. So when there is this longer term horizon, then it's complicated to negotiate with people who are unprepared because they're going to make you miss interesting opportunities. But the more you create trust with them, the more probably you're going to help them realize that it is not simply in your interest, but also in their interest to come to the next meeting better prepared. And you can even help them by asking the good questions. Uh, my friend, maybe uh, for the next meeting, I suggest that both of us and of course you did it already, but both of us, we think about question X, possibility uh, Y, and option uh, Z. And then you prompt some sort of preparation on their side for mutual benefit. Very, very practical. Thank you. That's helpful. So uh, the, men, the term ZOPA, the term ZOPA has been mentioned, zone of possible agreement. A couple of our audiences are bringing it in. Does it relate to what we just discussed here? Absolutely. The zone of possible agreements is the area between your red line and the red line of the other side, between what you've been authorized to do by your boss and what they've been authorized to do by their boss. And the job of negotiators is to identify if there is a zone of possible agreements and where it is. And that is why you need to accept to exchange information. I tell you a little bit more about my concerns, my expectations, my constraints, and I help you understand why I'm serious about it. But I prompt also information sharing from your side so that you help me understand what you expect, what you could do, what you cannot do, and why. So that step by step, we move into some sort of understanding if there is a ZOPA. Because in some negotiations, there's no ZOPA, there's no zone of possible agreements. And we better realize this because otherwise we're wasting our time. Uh, there's no way this negotiation will be concluded because there's no, there's no point matching your constraints and my constraints. So again, there's a premium for negotiators who, thanks to the sort of connection they've managed to establish, can exchange enough information to identify if there is a ZOPA and if yes, whereabout. And this takes, in, uh, takes place in the relationship component or the preparation? Is it okay to begin at the preparation with that? Well, Spot, it's connected. It's demonstrated the better the relationship between the people, the easier it is to exchange information. But second principle, preparation. In your, the pool of information you have, there are certainly information you should not reveal to the other side because the minute they know it, it provides them with a, some sort of advantage. 
So in your preparation, and that is point number nine, communication, you need to identify what should you tell the other, maybe upfront, to clear the air of any difficulty or to reassure them, or to be very clear on something you expect. And at the opposite end, what are the pieces of information you should never, ever, ever reveal to the other side? So that takes preparation. Well, as you know, a lot of our executive MBA students come from family business backgrounds. So we have a question from Amal Osman, who's saying in family business, emotions prevail. How can we deal with pointing fingers, blaming, accusing, inefficiency, turning a meeting emotionally? Well, I, guess I, under, I understand the, this would be for the internal, internal negotiation. Yes, yes. Which, which is indeed. It's, it's yeah. a value, you know. Yeah, so this is a lot about principle number three, uh, building an internal <laughs> consensus before negotiating externally. And that would be my first, that would be my first advice. Uh, if you are, especially in a family business, never ever, ever let others know about your internal disagreements. So take principle number three very seriously. Settle that internally without anyone else knowing about it. Now, of course, how to do it. Uh, do not hurt feelings. Uh, acknowledge your own limitations. Show respect to your elder or to um, don't take things for granted. Uh, take the time to explain your reasons. Pick the right moment. Um, it might not be uh, at the end of the day when everybody is already uh, very tired. Um, again, organize the logistics. You see, it's more difficult to get angry around a dinner when people have, are sharing food. It's demonstrated. So pick the right moment, organize the logistics, um, uh, frame your arguments in a way which is uh, easier for the other to, to, to listen. Uh, so most of the things we've said about external negotiation can be applied to this internal consensus building. Uh, let them speak instead of talking and talking, talking. All of that can help you in this sort of setting. Okay, thank you. We have one on the external side from Ahmed Nasif. He's asking again, what is the difference between negotiating and selling? Because sometimes what you're explaining does fit into the selling part. Yeah, the, the selling will be one part of the uh, negotiation perimeter. Uh, because in some negotiator, so in some negotiations, we're trying to sell something. So we're trying to convince someone to buy something at a certain price. But negotiation goes beyond that. I mean, when you are uh, with colleagues trying to build a joint project, you have to agree on principles. You have to brainstorm in order to uh, uh, create value together. You have to be creative, and that is not simply about selling. It's about uh, imagining something together. It's about agreeing on joint rules for a joint venture. Uh, so it goes beyond selling. But in negotiation, sometimes you need to agree on pricing. You need to agree on uh, you get this, I get that. And, and that touches upon more basic selling uh, attitudes. Thank you. We have one from Abdel Fateh uh, Sheikh, and he's asking, what about the opponent if he's trying just to negotiate or to offer negotiations as a trick, not, not genuinely open to negotiating? And that, can you detect that early on, or how do you figure it out? Very good question. I mean, again, whenever we negotiate, we're using our time, we're using our energy, so it cannot be wasted. And sometimes people will engage in negotiation with you, but simply to look good for the gallery. Uh, they don't want to be perceived as the spoiler, but they have no real interest to conclude a deal with you. They're just wasting your time. And here again, two principles will help you. Preparation before action and listening before talking. If you prepare well, if you try and do some homework and fact finding on the situation on the other side, you can get information showing that probably they're not that interested to negotiate with you. So you're a bit more prepared. And listening before speaking, ask them plenty of questions. Make them talk, grab information in order rapidly to check whether they're really interested. So it's worth for you investing in that negotiation or whether it's a bit, you know, uh, 
not so sure. Okay. We have one on the political side also now. What if you're in a negotiating place? And then uh, the question goes like this. There's advanced negotiations and parties are infiltrated. So that's the term used into negotiations and uh, you can't face them that you know they're infiltrated, right? So there's this whole political uh, aspect. So you cannot face them that you know and you must carry on gaining their approval. Is that, am I explaining the question properly? You mean that you're negotiating with, with an opposite number, but this opposite number is infiltrated by? Some interest group, yeah, or something. Interest group. Well, we will need to go into the specifics of a situation like this. Um, but that would probably be a problem more for the other side, for, for the other side than for yourself. Uh, again, you cannot control what's happening on the other side. Uh, they have to uh, build their internal consensus, and hopefully they will do it. But you cannot do it for themselves. Uh, around the negotiation table, the best you can do is make sure that on your side things are properly organized and that you're not infiltrated by uh, the sort of partisans. But just to add on, on this, if I may, uh, in negotiations, in political negotiations, and you see, I've been an advisor to the French prime minister for four and a half years, and on a regular basis, uh, I advise political um, leaders. In political negotiations, we fail a dilemma. If we negotiate only with nice people, then the negotiation is easy. Mm -hmm. because they're nice. But the outcome is unlikely to change many things in reality because we have all the hardliners who've not been part of the negotiation. And on the contrary, if we invite the hardliners, the difficult people, in the negotiation meeting, then of course the process of the negotiation is more complicated. But if we reach a deal nevertheless, that deal is more likely to have an impact on reality because all these people have been involved in the deal making. Thank you. Um, there's a question also on leadership. I know you do, you know, mitigation, negotiation, leadership. What's the overlap between the person negotiating and the leadership skills that they require to have? Oh, there's loads of leader, um, loads of overlap. It's a very good question. I mean, uh, good negotiators um, have leadership qualities because. If you go through these uh, principles I've, I've mentioned, I mean, leadership means usually that you have a good sense of the longer term. Leaders, they, they work today in order to secure a better tomorrow. And that is building uh, relationship before you need them. It's preparing before action. Good leaders, they know to have a powerful voice Okay, they know how to convey the message, but they know also how important it is to listen to people. I mean, good leaders. And that's similar also in uh, negotiation. Up to the 10th principle. I mean, good leaders, they know that until the very end of a process, they need to remain accurate, fresh, um, careful, because everything can change at the last minute. And negotiators also, they do this, and that's my 10th principle. So until the very end, check and double check everything. All right, thank you. Uh, if it's okay, we have two more questions and we'll wrap this up. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I do wanna thank those who sent their questions, uh, Farid Haddad, uh, Muhammad Habib, and uh, again, uh, Ahmed Al Nasif. Uh, I have one, uh, you mentioned in a slide, the decision maker and the negotiator, right? In a time of crisis like this, um, how do we, you know, for, uh, the, do the decision makers step into the job of the negotiator without that training, without that skill, because they can actually make the, you know, there's some sort of agility required to react to the situation. So uh, is there something you can advise on that? Yeah, very good question. In times of crisis, people may wonder whether negotiation is the right decision making system, because it takes longer. I see. Uh, whereas people can simply uh, decide and then that's it. So indeed, uh, negotiation might be a bit too slow for crisis moment. But on the other side, crisis moment, and I've been working a lot on crisis management, a, a defining feature of a crisis is that you need to pull together the efforts of plenty of actors because nobody's got the full picture, nobody's got the, um, the capability to settle the crisis 
on his or on her own. You need to pull together people. And again here, the 10 principles I've shared with you are applicable. It is not in time of crisis that you're going to create connections, trust, relationships. Hopefully, you've done that beforehand. It's not in times of crisis that you're going to, uh, um, um, uh, to uh, use some action, some plan. You need to have prepared that beforehand. So precisely because our times are going to be increasingly packed with crisis, we need to anticipate using this sort of methodology. Thank you. And uh, one last one, I'm sure you get this one a lot. It has to do with the diverse cultures and negotiation across different cultures, whether it's the Middle East or the US and uh, I have China. So uh, can you just in, in a couple of minutes before we wrap up, just mention. Yeah, yeah. very good question also. Uh, uh, together with the team, we've done negotiation assignments in 81 or 82 countries. And of course there are cultural differences from one national, to another nation, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, I don't know any country without strong regional differences. I mean, if you go to the United States, um, a negotiator from the Boston area on the East Coast, or someone from California, or someone from Alabama, they're all American. Do they have the same culture? No, because they have a very strong regional culture. Then you have professional cultures. A lawyer will not negotiate the same way than a salesperson. And even if you take two lawyers, one of them could come from a very big, big, big law firm with a very strong corporate culture. Whereas the other lawyer is in the family uh, little firm and have a different corporate culture. So at the end of the day, good negotiators know that in front of them, there is a unique person gathering all these cultural identities and influences, the nation, the region, the job, the education, the personal value. So that is why principle number one, take the time to build a relationship with a unique individual who is in front of you. Very nice. <laughs> exactly, and under preparation also, if you need to acquaint yourself with the new culture, the new person, it's part of the research you do before you jump into the, the meeting. Very nice. Very much, uh, Orian. Thank. You. It's been a pleasure. Uh, pleasure. Thank you. We hope to see you in Cairo soon for the Executive MBA cohort running uh, soon. Also, uh, if anyone has any more information about the series or the Executive MBA, please do uh, hit us up in the email. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'll just uh, conclude the session. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.